without any further delay, I present to you Dr. Saul, and he's going to show you kind of how he developed it and the reasoning behind it and, and the evidence for why I think it's going to change what we do is and let us play to win. Dr. Saul, everybody. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thanks, Adam, for the introduction. What I'd like to do is to share with you the work we've been doing in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia, how we use the application of stem cells to manage uh, uh, musculoskeletal problems. Um, I come from Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia, and it's actually a long way to get here. You know, my first flight was um, flight in Dubai, and then we flew to Houston, and that was like 16 hours flight, and then from there, a short flight to Pensacola. Um, the musculoskeletal system consisted of muscle, tendon, ligaments, and cartilage, and connective tissues, and all that has to work together. Um, what we can do is actually to use stem cells to help to regenerate the articular cartilage, but a spin-off of that is that we've actually found that we can do the same thing to assist bone regeneration and also soft tissue, which I'll share that with you. This is the knee joint, and at the ends of the knee joint, what we have is the articular cartilage, and that provides a smooth gliding surface to the knee joint. But when the cartilage breaks down, the end result is the exposure of the bone, and that causes pain to the knee joint. Now, if it's a 60 year and above older patient, then the result of a knee replacement works very well. But what if you have a young patient with an isolated injury or a bone and bone injury, then it makes it difficult to have the patient to have a knee replacement because as you know, as orthopedic surgeons, that knee replacement is just going to break down. And revision surgery is always a real problem for young patients. Now, if you look at the current methods of chondrogenesis, you're talking about um, oats, you're talking about ACI, you're talking about open surgery. A lot of these are expensive and sometimes the results are quite inconsistent. So for many years, what I've been doing for cartilage lesions is that I've been drilling them and then give them intra-articular injections of hyaluronic acid. And I find that I get a reasonable result, but again, the results are inconsistent because we know that it's just fibrocartilage regeneration. So about eight or 10 years back, we thought, can we improve this technology? Can we drill and add stem cells and then regenerate a better cartilage, which is a lot more resilient than the fibro cartilage? So we look at stem cells. We look at cells that's able to um, develop into progenitor cells and then differentiate into all the specialized tissues that we need for chondrogenesis. And we started a preclinical animal work and we wanted a proof of concept. We wanted to know whether can we drill and then add autologous marrow cells and with that, can we regenerate a better articular cartilage? So we have a control group where we did drilling and add nothing. So it's like microfracture with no intra-articular injections. As you can see, it's just fibrocartilage with no evidence of any collagen type 2. <coughs> now the group that we give HA intra-articularly you can see there's a bit more proteoglycans and a bit more collagen type 2. So HA works very well with the microfracture or drilling. But the group that created a better cartilage is the group that we give HA plus the marrow aspirate, the autologous marrow aspirates. Okay? And with that, you can see a very good collagen type 2, a lot of proteoglycans, minimal collagen type 1, and a lot of chondrocytes. Now, that proof of concept is very important because we want to know can you drill, harvest the marrow cells, freeze it in liquid nitrogen, a week later, tore out the cells, mix it with HA, and intra-articular injections into the joint. Right? So that proof of concept is important in this animal uh, model. And we published our paper in 2009, and the conclusion is that if you do drilling and add HA plus marrow cells, you can actually regenerate a better cartilage. And the clinical relevance of that is actually you can do this arthroscopically and inject intra-articularly into the joint. So you can do everything arthroscopically. So we started our phase one clinical trial and we look at clinical work and we find that it's actually very difficult to harvest enough bone marrow. So another alternative with that is actually harvest the cells from the peripheral blood. And this is the same procedure that the hematologists have been doing for the last 20 years for bone marrow transplant. So 30 years ago, they used to take bone marrow aspirate, but it's difficult to get bone marrow aspirate. So in the last 20 years, they moved on 
to use peripheral blood for bone marrow transplant. So it's something that's been around for the last 20 years, and all you need is actually mobilization using GCSF. This is a very typical apheresis process that we have, and you know, soon you'll have this um, in, in a lab up here, and we have an apheresis machine connected to the femoral vein, and with that, we draw out the blood, the machine centrifuge it, and return the red blood cells and collect the stem cells for storage. Okay, so we actually centrifuge out the buffy coat that collects the stem cells. So centrifuge process, collecting the stem cells, and then the lab, we mix it with DMSO and plasma and freeze it in liquid nitrogen at minus 196 degrees Celsius. And at that temperature, you can actually maintain the cells, keep the cells in frozen state for many, many years. And we look at our own lab, we have a viability of post tor at about 85%. The industrial standard is actually minimal or 70% for autologous transplant. Now, preferred blood stem cell has been around for a long time. It's got a long track record and, you know, bone marrow transplant, either autologous or allogenic. So, in our case, we use autologous uh, transplant. And we started our first phase back in 2007, an arthroscopic drilling, put the patient on the CPM two hours a day for a month, and then partial to full weight bearing. On day four, five, and six, we then give them uh, GCSF, which is granulocyte stimulating hormone. And what that does is that it mobilizes the white blood cells, the, the stem cells, from the marrow into the bloodstream. So your white cell will raise up to about 20, 30, 40,000, and then the centrifuge process will centrifuge um, the stem cells uh, for storage. So the first injection, if we can, we always try to use the fresh cells because fresh cells has got a viability of 99%. The second to fifth injection will have a viability of about 85% in our lab. So second to fifth week, we give frozen cells. And basically, we just tore up the cells, mix it with HA, aspirate the knee of any hemarthrosis, and then injection of the stem cells plus HA into the knee joint. So this is what we do. We do arthroscopic drilling and mix the stem cells with HA, aspirate, and inject into the joint. And when you inject into the joint, you'll see that the bone will eventually heal, followed by the subchondral layer, and then regeneration of your articular cartilage. In the early days, we are using a 1.5 Tesla extremity. Now we've moved on to using a 3 Tesla machine to assess our cartilage regeneration. Um, if you see here, you can see the surface layer of the articular cartilage. And if you notice carefully, you can see the black line that separates the articular cartilage from the underlying bone. And that's actually your calcified cartilage layer and also your subchondral bone plate. Now, it's important to see regeneration of this layer. So this is the first patient that we did in 2007 with the isolated lesion of the lateral femoral condyle. You can see straight after drilling, you can see the disappearance of that black line and also marrow edema. But as early as two months, you can see the reappearance of that black line showing bony regeneration. And then as time progresses, it undergoes remodeling and regenerates the black line, the marrow edema disappears, and then you get articular cartilage regeneration. And from there, we started doing more complex cases. And this lady presented to my clinic. She had seven open surgery because of recurrent dislocation of patella. And she was 35 years old, and she was advised to have a total knee replacement. And at that time, we'd done a few cases, and I told her, look, I can do this procedure. If it doesn't work, you can always have a knee replacement. So we took away the medial osteophyte. As you can see, we took away the whole chunk of medial osteophyte there. And then we did a lot of drilling. And six months and two years, you can see the reappearance of that patellar femoral joint. By then, her patellar femoral crepitation had disappeared. And we had a chance of doing a second look arthroscopy. And it was lucky that we did that because we realized that when we first did the drilling we we know about microfracture so microfracture tells us that you have to microfracture between three to five millimeter apart so we just followed drilling three to five millimeter apart but what we realized is that because you drill three to five millimeter apart when you have a second look arthroscopy the tuff of cartilage that grows is actually three to five millimeter apart so we know that we're drilling too far apart 
But when we did the individual biopsy, what we could see is that what we can see is that we can see a lot of collagen type 2, absence of collagen type 1, a lot of safranin O. And in the area that I took away the middle osteophyte, you can see very nice confluence of articular cartilage, you know, with a lot of collagen type 2, absence of collagen type 1, a lot of safranin O, and a lot of chondrocytes. So, so if you're more aggressive, you get better articular cartilage regeneration. So we know that if you have an uncontained lesion, you have bone-on-bone -bone lesion, if you drill too far apart, it's actually the blood clot scaffold is actually in the drill hole. All right? And that's where the marrow cells, the peripheral blood stem cells, when you inject, will home back into the area of injury, migrate into the blood clot scaffold, and then regenerate the articular cartilage. Um, so that is the chondrogenesis process if you drill into the bone. So at that time, we started doing a combination of high tibial osteotomy and stem cells injection after drilling. So these are early cases where we drill about 3 to 5 millimetres apart. And you can see the second look arthroscopy show, show reasonable cartilage regeneration with a lot of collagen type 2 and almost absence of collagen type 1. Now what I'd like to show you is that this is the intercondylar notch that I did a um, notch plasty. And you can see the regeneration of the cartilage there. And when I sent a biopsy to my pathologist, and he said to me, what is this, what is this intercondylar notch biopsy? Is this an area of non-weight bearing? I said, yes, and why did you ask? He said, look, the femoral condyle and tibial plateau, the cells are lining up very nicely. A lot of collagen type 2 and almost absence of collagen type 1. But the intercondylar notch, which is a non-weight bearing area, has got minimal collagen type 2 and more collagen type 1, and the cells are not lining up nicely. So the important message here is that load bearing is actually very important for chondrogenesis. So if you don't load bear, the cartilage is not going to grow nicely. Okay? So in this tibial plateau injury that we see, um, you can see the drill hole. At two years, you can see the drill hole is full of chondrocytes and ossifying into bone. So at two years, we're still seeing remodeling. And a lot of, um, when you magnify the area, these are all chondrocytes, a lot of protoglycans, and a lot of collagen type 2. Now, the kissing lesion is also in the middle femoral condyle. So when we did a biopsy, these are bone on bone lesions, don't forget, okay? These are not partial thickness, these are full bone on bone lesions. Now, now we can see the reappearance of the calcified cartilage next to the drill hole and also the appearance of the tight mark. So we can now see the whole layer of the articular cartilage regeneration. So in bone-on-bone -bone lesions, this is what we do now. We drill very close together, a bit of abrasion chondroplasty, and by doing that, you get lots of drill holes with lots of blood clot scaffold, and when you inject the cells, it will home into the area of injury and eventually go back to the home, which is actually the marrow. And as the individual tuft of cartilage grow, because you drill close together, you're going to get a coalescence of that area and then increase um, of thickness of your articular cartilage. So our principle of chondrogenesis is we drill or burr 2 mm to a depth of 5 to 10 millimeters, leaving a gap of 1 or 2 millimeters in between, a bit of light burring in between, but the importance to correct of the virus or valgus deformity, uh, you need to treat the ACL or PCL or combination of problems. Now, the viability of the cells are very important. In the early days, we had a company that supplied us with cells, and sometimes when we injected the cells, they had tremendous pain because we eventually found out the viability of the cells that they provided us was something like 15% or 20% viability. You know? So the, the lab is very important. The number of injections is important the rehab is equally important. Okay? So we published this paper in 2011, and the conclusion of that paper is that we can now regenerate good articular cartilage by arthroscopic drilling and followed by intraarticular injection of stem cells and HA. From there, we started a randomized control trial, and we had a group of 50 patients randomized into 25 patients after drilling with just HA and 25 patients after drilling with HA plus stem cells. And 
we use a MOCAP score um, for MRI evaluation. And as you can see, there's a statistical significance that the MRI scan showed that the group with stem cells uh, created a better articular cartilage. And we also had a chance of doing a second look arthroscopy of the lesion and taking a 2mm core biopsy and using the ICRS2, which has got 14 parameters. And again, the statistics shows that the group with stem cells created a better articular cartilage. So let me give you an example. This is a normal cartilage biopsy of a medial femoral condyle. You can see a lot of safranin O that shows protoglycans. You can see almost absence of collagen type 1, and it's all full of collagen type 2. Now, this is a biopsy of a 47-year-old female patient from the medial femoral condyle. <coughs> you can see here, with just HA, there's actually absence of protoglycans, a lot of collagen type 1, and absence of collagen type 2. So this is basically fibrocartilage. When you look at second look arthroscopy, the cartilage looks quite nice, but it's actually fibrocartilage. Now, this again is a 47-year-old patient, medial femoral condyle with stem cells and HA. You can see a lot of safranin O, a bit of collagen type 1, and a lot of collagen type 2. Now, this biopsy is taken at 18 months, but I believe that as time progresses, that layer will eventually rub off and that will remodel into a better articular cartilage if you biopsy that at a later stage. So we published this paper and the conclusion of that paper is that um, when you drill into grade 3 and grade 4 lesions, when you add stem cells, you can actually regenerate a better cartilage and that's shown on histology and also on MRI scan. Um, so what we're doing now is look at what is important for chondrogenesis. The surgical technique is very important the number of cells is important as well, and the rehab is important. Now, why microfracture don't work so well? Um, firstly, I think it's too far apart, and I think it's too shallow. And if you don't give any HA or don't give any stem cells, there's not enough progenitor cells, progenitor cells from the endogenous uh, uh, area. And just give me an example. Initially, I thought that it's the blood clot that's important. So in the early days, when I tried to drill the back of the tibial plateau. It's always very difficult to drill. So I thought, if it's blood clot that you need, why don't we just burr it and take an inkwell? You know? and because if the blood clot is important, and that's all we need to do. So, so in the early days, when we do our combination of high tibial osteotomy and plateau drilling, at the back portion, I used to use a, a four millimeter burr and just do a, a, a inkwell procedure. But the front end, I will drill because if I can get access to that, I will do drilling of that. <coughs> so that's the femoral condyle drilling. And this is a high tibial osteotomy at seven months. And as you can see, the pre-op and the anterior half is actually devoid of articular cartilage pre-op. And 18 months later, you can see the cartilage regeneration. So this is the femoral condyle. We can see beautiful articular cartilage regeneration. The anterior half of that, we can see because of the drilling, we can see very good articular cartilage. But the posterior half where we did that inkwell, when we didn't drill into that, you can see only a thin layer of articular cartilage regeneration. And you can also see that on the uh, second look arthroscopy. The posterior half do not have good articular cartilage because you do not drill into the bone. So the biopsy from the anterior half, as you can see, a lot of safranin O, minimal collagen type 1, and a lot of collagen type 2. Now, do you need a meniscus? If you need a meniscus, that's where the meniscus should be on an MRI scan. But I think because we drill all the way into the bone where the meniscus should be, um, the final regeneration of the articular cartilage shows that perhaps you know, a meniscus transplant is not necessary. So we've done many cases now, and, and I don't think the meniscus transplant is necessary in cases like that because the cartilage just grow and replaces the area of meniscus defects. And this patient came back to me five years after a HDO and chondrogenesis. And, and he came back one day and says, look, I got a bit of knee pain. I said, um, yeah, what have you been doing? And he said, you know, I've been on this corporate challenge. And in 16 weeks, he went up a mountain in, 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 in Taiwan and walked 850 kilometers. That's five years after his HDO and chondrogenesis. 
Now, in the early days, as you can see, these are early pictures now. Uh, this is a patient with a valgus knee and a torn anterior cruciate ligament. And I did the drilling and uh, we did a ACL reconstruction and a one-stage uh, supracondylar virus osteotomy. And you can see the cartilage regeneration. But the early days, as you can see, the middle femoral con the lateral femoral condyle I drilled quite far apart. And you can see the individual tuft of cartilage and the area is not so smooth. And we did inkwell procedure at the back. Again, you know, you don't regenerate a, a nice layer of articular cartilage. But when we take the individual tuft of cartilage, when we biopsy those areas, you can see that that individual tuft of cartilage that grew actually regenerated very good articular cartilage. A lot of suffering in O, a lot of you know, collagen type 2. So we know that if you drill one hole, if you load it, you can grow one tuft of cartilage. So by that, you can actually drill the whole knee without worrying about it. You know? So this is a patient that um, we did about two years ago. You can see the pre-op and the post-op at two years. And this is what we do now, the refined technique by drilling, by burring, drilling it close together, we get a very nice confluence articular cartilage now and with, again, very good histology with collagen type 2. Now, this is a paper that we're going to be publishing soon. Um, when you look at a normal cartilage ICRS2 scores, you know, you can have 100% for normal cartilage. In our randomized control trial, in the group that we give just HA, you can approach about 70% of a normal cartilage scores. The group that we did um, stem cells in the randomized control trial, we gave five injections and then we gave three injections at six months. Okay? But that cartilage only approaches about 80% of a normal cartilage scores. But in the patient with high tibial osteotomy, we gave stem cells into the osteotomy site and also multiple injections. So five injections initially and three injections at six months, 12 months and 18 months. And in those patients, you can see that the cartilage actually approaches more than 90% of the normal articular cartilage scores. You know? These are worst case scenarios, but multiple injections give you a very good articular cartilage. So the multiple injections is important, as important as the surgical technique. So this is what we do, we drill and we do the arthroscopic drilling and when you finish the arthroscopic drilling, you get the blood clot scaffold. But it's important to actually remove the, the, the surrounding cartilage which is actually damaged. All right? And a bit of light burring and then drilling into the bone. So the multiple drilling, close drilling is important, deep into the bone and when the blood clot scaffold forms, when you inject your cells, what happens is that you have endogenous cells, okay? But if you just drill and give HA, I don't think there's enough cells from the marrow will populate that blood clot. And that's the reason why you get a better result when you add uh, intra-articular injections of your stem cells plus the HA. And as you can see earlier on, you can regenerate the bone, the black line, which is a subchondral bone layer, and articular cartilage. So this patient, um, you can see the bone-on-bone -bone lesion if you drill too far apart and if you have poor quality cartilage, that's going to break down, you know. But if you drill closer together, it's like you lying on a bed of nails. So you die, a nice bed of nails is much better than lying on two nails, okay? Because that individual nail will give you too much loading, all right? So if you have more drilling, you get, you know, less force acting on those individual tough of cartilage. So theoretically, there's less loading and less breakdown of that cartilage, especially if you can rebuild good articular cartilage. Now, the patellofemoral joint is always a problem because every time you go up and down stairs, there's loading and there's shearing. So that's the reason why if you just microfracture the patellofemoral joint and if you microfracture too far apart, that cartilage is going to break down. You know? But if you remember, you need to load the patellofemoral joint, so when we first started doing this technique, we realized that the tibial femoral joint, the femoral condyles, and the plateau, they heal very well. But the patellar femoral joint, what we had is inconsistent result in the patellar femoral joint. And because every time the patient load bare, when the knee is ex fully extended, when they have a pair of crutches, you get loading in the tibial femoral joint. But unfortunately, in the patellar femoral joint, when they start 
walking, there's no loading in the patellofemoral joint at all. So in order to load that patellofemoral joint, we need to keep the knee in flexion. All right, so you need to know which angle and keep the knee in flexion. But the protocol is important because you can't load and shear. So you can't allow the patient to go up and down stairs immediately after surgery because you're going to just shear out all the articular cartilage. So in the patellofemoral joint, the concept is exactly the same. The surgical principle is the same. So basically, when the cartilage breaks down, we drill. So even if it's a bone-on-bone -bone lesion, it doesn't matter. It will, it will heal if you stick to the concept. Okay? So same concept, if you drill, you get the blood clot scaffold, bone-on-bone -bone lesion, you need to do static loading. That's what we do, static loading. We put the patient on the CPM and eventually cycling and hydrotherapy and everything. But as the tough of cartilage grow and you put a CPM, what happens is that you get smoothing out of the articular cartilage and eventually the thickness of the cartilage will grow. It's the same as the tibial femoral joint. It's just that it's a different joint and the rehab protocol has to be slightly different from there. So for example, this is a patient that I did a high tibial osteotomy and a tricompartmental problem. You can see patellar mouth tracking. I did an arthroscopic lateral release and drilling of the lateral patellar femoral joint. Now, when we had a chance of looking at second look arthroscopy, you can see that lateral patellar facet is actually healed up very nicely. The trochlea is healed up nicely. And what I noticed was that there's this area in the central trochlea that has got lesser cartilage. You know, and that's when the penny dropped. And then I realized that it's actually loading in the patellar femoral joint that's actually very, very important for chondrogenesis. When you don't load, you don't get good cartilage. So just think about this. You have a lateral patellar release, okay? The medial side is protected, the central trochlea is protected, but even after a lateral release, you still have more pressure on the lateral patellar femoral joint. So the central patellar femoral joint has got less pressure and less articular cartilage regeneration. It's the same as the intercondylar notch, you know, less loading, poor quality cartilage regeneration. So the same patient has got medial femoral condyle that we drill and also the lateral femoral condyle. So when you do a high tibial osteotomy now, you are not limited to just intact lateral compartment. You can actually treat tricompartmental disease because you can regenerate cartilage in all the three compartments. Okay? So the biopsies from the lateral trochlea, lateral femoral condyle, and medial femoral condyle, again, showed a lot of collagen type 2. Now this is my professional footballer. Um, ex-professional footballer, as you can see, the lateral compartment is totally devoid of articular cartilage and bone-on-bone -bone lesion, okay? So again, same principle, multiple drilling into the area, that's the lateral tibial plateau, and we now have found a technique of getting to the back of the tibial plateau, but you do not need to drill perpendicular. You can drill at 20, 30 degrees, so long as you drill deep into the bone, that cartilage will grow. So you can see this is following uh, drilling, and you can see the various angles that we drilled in the lateral compartment post-op, and six months later, notice that black line again. That black line is a regeneration of your calcified cartilage layer and also the type mark with formation of superficial articular cartilage. So that's post-op, and this is six months later. This patient had three or four microfractures over a period of 10 years and eventually came to the clinic because she had a lot of pain. And we did drilling. We did not do any bone grafting. We did drilling, removed a lot of, of a dead bone from there and left it with a big defect and injected stem cells. And as you can see, as early as three months, you can see the filling up and the reappearance of that black line at three months. And at one year, that's hypertrophy of the area and two years remodeling and regeneration of that black line and articular cartilage. Um, Nick Geary is actually a consultant orthopedic surgeon. He was actually my boss in 1990. He taught me orthopedic surgery when I was a junior registrar in the UK. Um, a few years back, he injured his cartilage while skiing. And we met up uh, while I was having a, a, a meeting in, in Paris. And he eventually came to KL. Um, and we treated him uh, by drilling into his knee and gave him all these uh, stem cells. So he had a really bad injury. You can see in his lateral femoral condyle and the plateau, he had a bone-on-bone -bone lesion. So we drilled into that area, and this is five months post-op. You can see the regeneration of his articular cartilage. He had the patellar mouth tracking. 
So we drill into the patella facet, you can see there. And uh, notice the lateral release there. <coughs> and five months later, you can see the repair of the lateral release by giving stem cells and also the regeneration of the articular cartilage with a black line that's very consistent. Okay? Now the lateral trochlea, so this is bone-on-bone -bone lesion. You can see the damage to the lateral trochlea and you can see that drilling there in the lateral trochlea. And this is five months later, you can see the reappearance of the black line and the formation of the articular cartilage. I can tell you it's not easy to operate on your old boss. Okay? And you need to get him back skiing. If you can't get it right, you're in a real trouble. Um, now, think about the synovial fluid. Um, when we look at cartilage injury, always think about the cartilage and also the synovial fluid. Now, before we started doing a lot of these injections, I never noticed that the synovial fluid is actually so important. Um, because we've done multiple aspiration of the synovial fluid, and then realized that, you know, if you do arthroscopic surgery, if you aspirate the knee one week later, there will be hemarthrosis. But if you feel that synovial fluid between your gloves, it is rough. You know, it's like water. It doesn't have any lubrication properties. And you can see at one month, it's still very liquid. Even at three months, it's very liquid. And it normally don't become normal until at least six months up to about 12 months. So it's important to tell the therapist that you should not push the patient too quickly, especially when they go up and down stairs, running up and down stairs a few weeks after surgery. You are running an engine with water and that cartridge will break down. So since we did our animal study and we published our study that shows that HA um, gives you a better articular cartilage, even following just drilling, I've been giving my patient intra-articular injections of HA straight after surgery and first five weeks after surgery we give them HA and it's been shown to minimize the coefficient of friction if you do that and it protects your cartilage. So the articular cartilage injury is important to think about synovial fluid and role of HA and also you know the various aspects of it you know the ACL injury, the instability, the mechanical axis. Now in the last seven years or so, I've done about more, more than 500 cases now, and a lot of our patients actually involve the patellar femoral joint because you know, very few of my colleagues will treat patellar femoral joint. And majority of cases is actually multiple lesions that we treat. About 20% of our cases are so associated with the cruciate ligament injury. An isolated injury is actually very, very few. It's only about 6%. All right? And some of them that we've done is actually in combination with the osteotomy. And the male and female distribution, but the commonest age group is actually between 40 to 50 year old. Now, we are now looking at safety data because it's actually very important to know what happens to your patient. And the IKDC scores, um, even at five, six years, is still maintained. But when doing MRI scan at about five months, five years, sorry, to bring our patients back because we want to know, are we getting any abnormal synovial tissue? Are we getting any abnormal bone tumours? You know? But we look at all these cases and we have not had any case of this abnormal abnormality that we are worried about. So it's quite safe to do your autologous cells and inject into the knee plus HA. So as an arthroscopic surgeon, you know, I like to do things arthroscopically. I don't like to open up the knee joint. You know, I like to treat osteochondral lesion. If we can treat kissing lesion, single procedure, scaffold free, simple delivery, but at the end of the day, you actually want to regenerate a good articular cartilage, which we now have a solution for that. Um, we filed for a US patent a few years back and been granted a US patent for this uh, method of chondrogenesis. And David McGuire, I spent some time with him in my early days um, in, in the mid 90s. And, and in one of our meetings, I met up with him, and he's been to Malaysia many times, okay? And when I, in one of the meetings, I shared this with him, and he said, I do not believe that this can happen. So he came, he saw this patient, and eventually, um, he, I got to Alaska and helped him um, to convince the blood bank of Alaska to set up a, a, a stem cell lab for him. And recently, he's just fine-tuning his lab, you know, to do exactly the same thing as what we're doing. Um, Gary Paling is from Wake Forest. I first met him in 2008. And again, we shared 
or slides, and at that time we won the best paper prize uh, in that meeting in Antalya in Turkey. And um, he invited me back to Winston Salem in 2009, and that's where I met this young Adam there. And again, in a meeting there, and, and eventually Adam came to visit us, and Adam has been to Malaysia four times now, and that's the last, uh, the last time he came. <coughs> And we also have an interest group from our colleagues in Liverpool. Uh, that w that's where I did my undergraduate and postgraduate education in medicine and surgery. And together with Liverpool group, we are trying to establish this procedure in the UK. So we are now applying through um, US FDA. We've been having a dialogue with the FDA for quite a long time. And, and we filed in uh, IND application. And we have a few issues to settle with the FDA, but hopefully that in not too distant future, we can start our multi-center trial um, together with Andrews Institute. Uh, the Malaysian government has, has agreed to fund the phase two trial for us so that you know, we have funding for that. And uh, recently, um, Dr. Gary Paling from Wake Forest and David Maguire and also Cambridge University and Liverpool has expressed interest in the multi-center trial. So we are, we, are, we are progressing in the right direction. So in this Phase two randomized control trial, we're looking at treating 280 patients um, with a control group and an intervention group. To keep things simple or keep things complicated, um, we have excluded the simple isolated injury, less than three centimeters squares that you can treat by microfracture. So the patient group that we're recruiting are the patients with worst case scenario. Large lesion, more than three centimeters squared, we're treating recruiting patient with bone-on-bone -bone lesions, so patellofemoral joint, bone-on-bone -bone lesion, tibiofemoral joint, bone-on-bone -bone lesions, patient with failed microfracture, patient with failed ACI. And these are the group of patients that we are, we are recruiting. And the reason why we're recruiting that, because we want a control group that is currently not treatable. Because if we keep a simple group, then we have to then do surgery and put HA or put do microfracture as a comparative study. But we already know that because you drill and you give HA as compared with stem cell, the stem cell group gives you a better histology. So it doesn't make sense to compare with anything else, you know, with all the evidence that we have. It's, it's, it's not nice to drill on patients and then they don't do well, you know. It's unethical to do that. So we decided to pick the most difficult group as a control group and intervention group for that. Um, we have our inclusion and exclusion criteria. Again, I said, we are picking the worst case scenario for our inclusion criteria, but there's also exclusion criteria that we have here. And we anticipated that you know, for the first three to five years, the trial will finish at two years and we have a phase two and phase three, and that's gonna take you know, five to 10 years to complete the trial. Um, I was asked to write this paper um, on application of stem cells on the muscle skeletal system. And this is an ankle joint. We can do that on the ankle joint as well. You know, it's not just the knee joint. And this is the osteochondral lesion. You can see that uh, uh, ankle joint arthroscopic surgery is done by drilling into the area. And when you finish, actually break a big defect there. But as early as nine months, you can see the reappearance of the black line and regeneration of the articular cartilage. And we've done many ankle joints and they actually heal up very well. Now, a tibial plateau, if you fix it, then why don't you just give stem cells, you know? Because there are areas when there's no articular cartilage, so you can prevent a secondary osteoarthrosis from happening. Elizarov, this is a patient of mine with a varus knee, a malunion, and a shortened leg, and with the absence of ACL and no cartilage in the middle compartment. So the first stage, we did Elizarov with him. And by adding um, peripheral bird stem cells, so we did a Elizarov distraction the day after surgery. We did not wait for two weeks. We gave stem cells one day after surgery, immediately after surgery, and you can see we distracted, and this is one week after application of stem cells. You see the amount of callus formation there, and this is at four months, and we realigned his leg, got it up to length, and then did an ACL and drilling to his middle compartment. Again, these are studies that we can continue to do. Diabetic foot with peripheral neuropathy, you can actually reverse the peripheral neuropathy. And the reason why you can reverse the peripheral neuropathy because the microangiopathy with stem cells will regenerate. As the vessels regenerate, it brings back and reverses the micro 
um, the peripheral neuropathy. This is one of my professional footballers who's been playing with bad patellar tendinitis for a year and eventually tore his ACL. So what I did was I did multiple drilling, percutaneous drilling into the inferior pole of patella and also the tibial tuberosity and the whole tendon. I just did multiple needling into the tendon and injected stem cells once a week for five weeks. And this is um, six weeks later. You can see you know, that by then his pain has settled. He's now one year post-op and he's now playing and he doesn't even look back onto his, his problems with patellar tendinitis. AVN, this is what we're doing now. Now, just think about this. If you can regenerate vessels, if you can regenerate bone, and you can regenerate articular cartilage, then you can actually treat AVN. And that's what we do. We drill all the way into the hip joint, okay? Multiple drilling into the hip joint, and then we inject stem cells plus HA into the hip joint and also from the outside so that you have a whole bunch of cells in there. And that cells will migrate back into the marrow, regenerate the bone, and regenerate the articular cartilage. So we've not done many cases, but the early cases are, are very encouraging. So just think about the concept now, you know, it, it actually, that whole principle seems to work. Um, this is a tennis elbow. Um, normally you would require an open surgery for that, and we did multiple percutaneous drilling. And this is three months later. And this is actually our Malaysian Prime Minister that we treated him about two years ago, and he's actually very supportive about what we're doing. Um, and so, you know, I'm going to New York with Adam uh, tomorrow because we have a meeting that's chaired by our Malaysian uh, Prime Minister on innovation. Um, this is our physiotherapy department. As you can see, there are lots of CPM there. Um, we have a website here, um, klsmc.com. I've given, I brought along some of the papers we've published, but it may not be enough. So any one of you who wants to download, we have all the papers here. You can download from klsmc.com. All the soft copies are there. Thank you very much. Dr. Saw, can you go back to uh, the slide where you said, was it inclusion or exclusion slide? About four, five, six slides back yep. for your study. Explain that again to us. So uh, while yep. he's doing that, uh, Adam, He's not going to do the three-pronged study where the uh, where you one of them just got saline or whatever. I thought there were three different columns in the original study. But are we, when we try to do this study here, you're not going to, you're going to have to do largely, you can't do the small ones? Right. Most gonna, are, are are small. Right. And so we're going to collect the, the difficult cases because the problem is if we try and do all cartilage defects, then we have to compare it to, it's, it's a more difficult study. And so we are purposely going for the more difficult, larger defects, and it's going to, that way we, we can just have a control group of hyaluronic acid and physical therapy. Because yeah. the proof of concept has already been there in terms of flushing out what's better in terms of surgery. So we don't want to put people to a surgery that we think is subpar. Yeah, Dr. Andrews, can I just explain? Um, you know, we, we've been thinking about the, this trial design about for quite a long time. percent of your patients. Yep. And that's why it's going to be multi I've been worried about numbers. You know, when we, when we were uh, talking about, discussing about the trial design, and what we didn't want to have is a control group that we drill and either give HA or do microfracture. 
because we know that it's going to be unethical. So in my randomized control trial that I did uh, four years back, we had a group that we drill and give HA, and another group we drill and give HA and stem cell. That's reasonable because we did not want to have a group that we drill and give nothing because from the animal paper, we knew that that, that cartilage is going to be just disastrous. You know? So it's not too bad if you drill and give HA because the results are not too bad. You know? But now that we have the histology and the randomized control trial that showed that stem cells is better than no stem cells, it's very difficult to have a control group that you drill and give no stem cells. It becomes unethical to do that. So we thought if we pick a group that is worst case scenario and a 40 year old with bone on bone lesion and the only option is a total knee replacement. We pick up these cases and the majority of these patients when they turn up in a clinic, you know, if they've done microfracture, if they've done ACI and it's failed, then most of the time you won't do, won't do anything apart from a total joint replacement. So we thought this would be a good group of patients to pick up. But as the trial moves along, you can have a another concurrent study where you can treat the smaller lesions. One arm study. Go back one slide before that. Let's see something. Back again. Uh, back, no, the other way. Keep going backwards. Uh, right here. Intervention group. Can you explain that to us, uh, Adam? Surgery? Yeah, so the control group will not have surgery. They'll just have hyaluronic no, I acid. I know the control. Yeah, yeah. I'm talking about the, the intervention, intervention group. The intervention group will get uh, arthroscopic subchondral drilling, uh, basically stimulation with Neupogen to take those cells from the bone marrow to the bloodstream, just like the hemoc doctors do. Tell us what you mean by that. They don't know what that is. So earlier he was, he was showing in his slides sort of the whole process soup to nuts. I must have missed that. And the, the whole process is, is what the hemoc doctors do for bone marrow transplant. When you need a bone marrow transplant, the hemoc doctors, they don't do a bone marrow aspirate anymore. They mobilize you with Neupogen. So they give you five injections. I'm sorry if you clap. I, I went out with a phone call. I missed that. So they, they mobilize you, meaning they make those cells go from the bone marrow to your bloodstream. And then once they're in the bloodstream, they collect them with this apheresis machine. So that's what the hemoc doctor's been doing for 20 years for bone marrow transplant. Y'all all understand that? And once, once yeah, then you have a, you basically have more cells. You can get more cells that way. And so people who are taking bone marrow and culturing them, -E peripheral blood stem cell. So that's th through the, uh, the two methods above, right? Correct. Yes, sir. <laughs> you can get as much as you want. <laughs> so when the hemoc doctors do a, a bone marrow transplant, they're collecting like three liters of cells. <laughs> And they sometimes they harvest people on multiple occasions. But the numbers that Dr. Saul has been collecting is about 200 milliliters. So what we're doing in terms of comparing it to the hemoc doctors is just about a fifth of what they collect. All right, but, one other question while we got him here. Are y'all going to be here first thing in the morning? We are. We've got a plane to New York City at about 1045. All right. Well, I want y'all, if you have a chance, uh, we need to show him the x-rays on that uh, professional basketball player that's 32 years old. Got a, a deep defect similar to that well, that degenerative one you said hmm? you had on some female or something there. It's on his lateral femoral condyle. Uh, yeah. And we're probably going to have to to breed him pretty good. He's, he's, he swells all the time. He's been playing uh, professional basketball over in Europe for, what, 10, 11 years. He's going to take this year off. If we could get y'all here, it's, uh, uh, Josh is going to do a, a, perif a uh, mesenchymal stem cell from his iliac crest first thing in the morning at 645. And could we get y'all to look at this when we get the scope in there and let him, I don't, we can't do what you're trying to do with all the multiple stem cells, but the, the debridement of it and the multiple drill holes, yep. give, and, and, and we can't, at this point, because he'll have to pay for it, we can't do multiple stem cell injections, but we could damn sure do hyaluronic acid and at least one stem cell tomorrow if you could help us with that case. True. Uh, it's a professional basketball. He's a great guy. Yeah. He lives close enough by we could do multiple MRIs on him, but we might be. I don't know if we can do multiple stem cells. Could y'all get over here by quarter to seven in the morning and let him observe that case and tell us what to do? 
Yeah. Have you seen it? I have not seen it. Who's got that MRI to show them? We might as well just show it to you in the morning. What What is he the... got hit? He got hit two years ago on the outside laterally on the left knee, and over the two years he developed this defect. It's about the size of your thumbprint. Is there a lesion in the plateau? Meniscus is okay. It's, it's up high on the on the lateral trochlea. He doesn't have he doesn't have patellofemoral lateral pressure or anything. It's a he got hit outside where it, where it's exposed. All right. That's where his, his defect is. You can see it in the morning because he, he's going to do the stem cell first. We'll have time to look at it and get 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 your ideas about what to do. Yeah. We're going to scope it first anyway. Yeah. And look at it. C can I just explain to you the 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 good, I know that there are limitations to what you can do with marrow cells, but actually the best time to give your stem cells is actually not immediately after surgery. It's actually at one week after surgery. So that, that is why the that. dilemma. We're yeah. <coughs> going to have to go with what we've yeah. got. Yeah. The reason behind that is we because... Do it, the problem is he's having, he's in the operating room. If we do it a week from now or something, he probably can't afford to get it done. Mm. Okay. Uh, but um, you know the the French doctors they've looked at uh, uh, a week later, huh? They they've looked at um, you know um, myocardial infarction patients, and if they give stem cells immediately as opposed to giving the stem cells three five to seven days, the ones that had stem cells five to seven days later actually do much better. So if you have one shot of that, you know, then then um, but if you can, you should bring him back for repeat marrow injections because that's important. If not at least give him HA. But I'm um, just telling Adam that if you drill deep into the bone and partial to full weight bearing from day one, and you'll find that if you do an MRI, so what we do is that we do an MRI post-op. So if you do surgery tomorrow, do an MRI post-op, and then you can chart the chondrogenesis, and that's a good way of doing it. Unfortunately, these patients can't afford a lot of that type of study from a financial standpoint. Uh, let me ask you one other question. Uh, you say hyaluronic acid. Uh, which one do you use, uh, Josh? Which one are we going to? Well, I know we. Is which one is he? I which use hyaluronic uh, acid. Are you using? Yep, I I I use hyaluron, and that's uh, from hyaluron. Um, that's from that's from Italy. And if you look at the the um, what what's been happening with HA. Halgen is actually one of the very early ones, and that's the only one that's classified as a drug. The rest of that, you know, like for example, Synvis and a lot of them are classified as medical device. So Halgen is the only product that's classified as a drug, really, because it's been established for a long time. And the reason why I use Halgen is that um, it's what I had in the clinic, and we had no conflict of interest. We did our animal work, and we found that we could regenerate good cartilage. And then when we did our human work, you know, that that regenerate very well. So so since then I've, I've been stuck with Haugen. I've not tried anything else. Which one are you supposed to use tomorrow? We're uh, going to use orthovisc. Uh, a higher, it's a heavier molecular weight as you know. Um, we've, we've kind of gone away from Haugen on the philosophy that it's a lower molecular weight. It's been thought of as more inflammatory compared to the heavier molecular weight. Uh, such as Uflexo or, or Orthovisc. Yeah. Uh, and Orthovisc comes in a one, one uh, single shot cartridge, sterile. Uh, Uflexo doesn't. So that's, uh, that's kind of the rationale but you want behind that. We've also had a patient or two, or one actually, with Hyalg and had a pseudo gout flare that has been reported. So we, we have not been using Hyalg like we used to in the OR. Hmm. It's cheaper, uh, but for those reasons, we don't. Y'all can discuss that, but, but it, is that what you have to use in this study? Which one he's using? Yeah. All right, one other question, and we need to probably talk tomorrow a little more about all this. What, when, you, when, they, when they burr the, artic, the uh, defect, how, uh, what, what are they? Uh, I know he's doing multiple small drill holes. Uh, but what, I, what what kind of burring is he really doing? How deep does he go? What what's he doing? Uh, five, to ten, five to ten millimeters with a two mill or five to ten millimeters deep with a two millimeter burr. Five it's, to ten millimeters deep. 
-hmm. So it's deep. It's deep, yeah. which is similar through to the what calcified. through the through that subchondral bone layer to the marrow. Well, he's pretty deep with it. And that's sort of what the a lot of a lot of the marrow stimulation techniques are all kind of going to. If you look at that nano fracture device, they talk about going deep, and that's what Dr. Saul through basically trial and error. Oh, just dust it then. <laughs> right, but he also dusts the top of it too. What what, what? He so he he does the the subchondral drilling, multiple drill holes, but then he does burr just a little bit to make and it. And how deep does he go with the burr? That's what I was asking. Oh, that very very shallow. Very shallow. Just dust it. Yeah, you were saying five. I asked you. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> For the drill holes, five to ten millimeters. Go oh, centimeter deep. But just dust in the top, like kind of like a lot like you do in terms of just About making same, it bleed. Just enough to do it. Just to make it bleed, and okay, then. Okay. What do you want to drill with tomorrow? I've been using the power pick, which is two millimeters, and it's power, and it's similar to what he's doing. Yeah, but he goes five to ten millimeters deep with that drill. Yeah. Can if we got that, that set up to do that tomorrow? That power this pick case, goes about seven. You need seven to set millimeters. that up if you can. Yeah. So we got the right drill to if this this copy we can't do everything he's doing on this case, but we can try to come as close to it as possible within the, the financial and the and the technique burden and whatever that we can do tomorrow. Is that all right? That's okay with Let's me. see what this guy wouldn't even fit into your criteria for inclusion, I don't think. How big is the lesion? Uh, we'll let you see it in the morning. I mean, if it's, a, if it's a thumb size, you'll be more than three centimeters squared area. Yeah, it's not that big. What, do you, what would y'all say? I don't know if we've even been able to measure it. Probably a centimeter and a half square. Okay, we'll have to look at that. It's a, not a kissing lesion. Didn't you say you had to have a no, if it's over three millimeter or three centimeters squared, it does not have to be kissing. So it's either a large defect over three centimeters in surface area squared, or a kissing lesion or a patellofemoral kissing. Right. Go forward. Yeah, let uh -oh. me. That's all right. We can look at it later. We've got a. Dr. DeCampos asks, how can they, how can the rest of us participate? Can we contribute patients? How would bone marrow or HA be paid for? I think probably Adam can <laughs> answer that question. So we are looking to include multiple uh, providers in terms of the surgery and, and patient capture. Uh, we'll, all of the injections will be paid for by the study uh, through the funding through the Malaysian government. So the postoperative injections are there and we're looking to provide more providers in terms of the surgery. Um, we've got fantastic facilities to show you how to do the drilling, and uh, we'd like to in include multiple people. And right now we're looking to, uh, basically, we have a memorandum of understanding to, to sort of just solidify our collaboration as much as we can, or as little as we can, as to on Wednesday we'll meet with the Prime Minister and we're going to show them just our agreement to work together on this project as we kind of put together the lab. All right, we'll dismiss everybody else and we'll do that with the other one here. Thank you all for coming.